And thank you for being here today. I just want to say a special thanks to those foundations that helped give the money for us to be able to do this distance learning program. Um, not only did they fund the Grizzly Bear Distance Learning Program, but they funded the Sage Grouse Distance Learning Program last year, and we'll be doing the Sage Grouse again this spring. Um, and those organizations are the Montana Outdoors Legacy Foundation, Trans Canada, you have the Claiborne Ortenberg Foundation, the Weyerhaeuser Foundation, and also um, the Dennis and Phyllis Washington Foundation. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kim Annis, and she is our Fish, Wildlife, and Parks Bear Specialist, and you'll be learning about grizzly bears today. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, everybody. I'm set down my water here, pick up my clicker, and we'll just jump right on in there because uh, we'll, uh, we'll take the entire 50 minutes that we, we have allotted today. So what we're briefly going to talk about is uh, the history of grizzly bears um, throughout lower 48 states and in Montana. We're briefly going to talk about the Endangered Species Act um, and how that affects uh, both our grizzly bears and ourselves as people. Um, and we're going to talk about research, how we know what we know about grizzly bears. And then we'll talk about management, the management of uh, human bear conflicts throughout the state and how that's different in a lot of areas. One of the things I just want to briefly bring up um, and is that this yes is a grizzly bear but everywhere else in the world they call it a brown bear and lewis and clark came um into montana and met this bear on the missouri and called it a grizzled old bear because of its coloration which is called a grizzled pattern and the name stuck so interior bears that don't live along the coastal areas of north america are called grizzly bears um, because lewis and clark kind of coined the name and everywhere else, they're called brown bears. They are still the same species of bear. So some brief history about grizzly bears. They used to uh, inhabit the entire western half of North America, including parts of Mexico. And, and uh, they uh, basically everywhere west of the Mississippi up until the uh, 1800s. And in the 1800s, we had a massive decline of grizzly bears. And uh, I'm going to ask you guys to, and we don't have our moderator, but I will ask you guys, what do you think the reason is, is that in the eight, between the 1800s and the 1900s, why did we have such a huge decline in grizzly bears in the Western North America? And Victor, I think we can hear you. Yeah, Victor, just make sure that you unmute your microphone. Why do you think we have had such a huge decline? Why do you guys think the grizzly bear population declined in the 1800s? Jack Jackson? Uh, hunting? Hunting? Uh, hunting and poaching? Uh, long uh, fur traders. Fur traders, he fur said. Traders. Wildfires. What? Wildfires. Wildfires? Yes. Oh, really Anybody good else? one. So I heard, so for coal strips, so they can hear us too. If they couldn't hear Victor, you guys had some great answers. You had uh, fur trading, uh, poaching, hunting, maybe unregulated hunting. Um, we had wildfires. And if coal strip, if you've got any um, ideas, um, type them in to us and we can bring those up um, and be able to include you guys. So all of those things that you talked about are correct. Basically what they lead to is that we settled the West. We colonized the West. We built towns, we built railroads, we built roads, we built cities. We changed their habitat to agriculture. We started ranching in large scales across their habitats. And we simply eliminated grizzly bears from those areas where we felt we could not live in connection with them across the landscape. And we eliminated them from um, being able to survive in much of that habitat. And the result was, is that they're limited to our mountain ranges in the lower part of the 48 states, because that's not where we build our houses and towns in any large scale. And this is where we still have large undeveloped areas through the national parks, through wildernesses, through preserves, and large parts of public land that still exist. So 
Um, all of those things were excellent, and those were all the right reasons. And Cold Strip absolutely hit it. Uh, habitat loss and colonization. Nice, excellent. You guys are rocking it today. All right, and you will see a map similar to this on the online platform, but just to briefly talk about what this is, is that this is related to what we call the Endangered Species Act. And I'm gonna throw this out there right now, so Cole Strip and Victor, you guys have time to think about your answers, which we'll ask for in just a minute. But the Endangered Species Act was created in 1975. Can you think of animals in the United States that have been listed as either endangered or threatened at, through the Endangered Species Act. So think about that amongst yourselves. Cole Strip, if you can type in. Victor, hold on to your answers for just a quick second and we'll have you chime in. We uh, created these ecosystems, basically these recovery zones, in order to help us recover bears in areas where we had large scales of undevelopment and this was a result of the Endangered Species Act. So grizzly bears are one of these animals, that they are listed as a threatened species under the Endangered Species Act. And what that means is that they are a species likely to become in danger in the foreseeable future throughout a significant portion of their range. So do we have answers to the question about other animals that in the United States are listed or uh, in, in endangered species? Yes. Victor, go ahead. Eagles, bald eagles. Louder. Bald eagles. Bald eagles. They were. They're not listed anymore, but yes, they were actually one of our first that were listed as an endangered species. Uh, wolves. Wolves were. That is correct. They're not anymore. Grizzly bears. Grizzly bears. Loud. Price. Loud. Price. Say it loudly. Price. Price. Louder. Grizzly bear. <laughs> yes, you are correct. Grizzly bears are listed species. Any others? Yeah. Black rhino. Black rhino. Not in the United States, but yes, they are part of the world. <laughs> <laughs> He's correct. United States. One more. Yes. Yes. Well, oh, yeah. Colster oh, yeah. came up with bald eagles as well. Excellent. Did Colster have any others they wanted to chime in? All right, you guys are all correct. Awesome, awesome. So you, I think on, on the online plant board, you will learn a little bit more about the Endangered Species Act, which is really tantamount to what we talk about and everything associated with grizzly bears, because they are still a federally listed species um, in danger of uh, losing them or their habitat. So these seven ecosystems were created in order to allow recovery of these of the grizzly bears to happen in these specific places. Um, with the hopes that these would be areas that they could eventually connect to with each other and have the least likely amount of human bear conflict because of the amount of large-scale public land at their cores. So how did we get through to where we were when we almost lost them? We literally have uh, grizzly bears in less than 2% of their former range in the lower 48 stage, meaning that we eliminated them from 98% of their original range, that's a lot. We still have them, how did we keep them? And how did we grow them to the point at which these two populations, the Greater Yellowstone and the NCDE, were looking at actually trying to remove them from the endangered species list and call them recovered. What we did was we eliminated hunting to try to uh, reduce our impact, human caused impact on their levels of mortality. We reduce the amount of direct persecution. Basically, that means is that we try to address people's fear, have people have a better understanding of what is normal for bears, what is not normal for bears. Um, and uh, we created bear managers in Montana, and that's uh, the people in my position. The bear specialists and bear managers go out. We are in and amongst our community. We work one-on-one -on -one with residents and members of our community to try to help them better understand grizzly bears, what they need, what is normal, what is not normal, and then um, help them prevent the conflicts that we know are likely to occur due to attractions. And we'll talk a lot about that in the latter part of things. So related to population size is reproduction. 
And with reproduction, um, we have a very special thing with grizzly bears. Grizzly bears are one of our slowest growing species of land mammals in North America. The way they do not grow very fast. They live to be about 25 to 30 years old. And in their lifetime, they may only per successfully produce a handful of bears to replace them. So if you're talking about a bear that say is 14 years old, a female does not have her uh, first set of cubs until she is six years old. She typically has two, but she can have anywhere between one and four, but she typically has two. One of those cubs will probably die before they reach the age of a year old. It's a rough life out there being a cub and trying to grow up without dying of natural causes. That cub has to stay with mom for two and a half years. So at six years old, um, it's not going to be uh, away from mom and independent until mom's almost nine. And so at, at independence, that bear has to now live another four more years. And mom is now 13 years old before that bear can actually successfully reproduce as well. So by the time that a female bear is 14 years old, she may have only successfully put one other female bear in her population to replace her. That's really slow and very frustrating for people because we want to recover these populations as fast as possible, but we can't make it any faster than it already is. One of the things we can do to help uh, grow the population is to reduce the unnecessary reasons why they die. So human caused reasons and maybe not very good ones. Hitting them by cars, uh, hitting them with uh, trains by accident. So if we can reduce a lot of those kinds of things, we can allow the population to slowly climb at its natural rate and be able to reach levels of recovery, which is our goal. I will say one thing here. Actually, I'll ask this as a question. How old do you think bears can reach in the wild? The oldest known grizzly bear was in Montana before she died. Does anyone have a wild guess as to what her age might have been? Let's let Victor go ahead and, and chime in on this one. Victor, any guesses to how the oldest 19, bear in the world 30, was when she 30, died? 35 years old. 35. I heard 35 is the primary, primary age. You're close. She was 37 years old when she died. Oldest known grizzly bear in the wild. And that was in the Cabinet Mountains of Montana, up near Libby and Troy. Nice job. All right, so how do we know all of these things about bears? Well, we actually have to capture and handle them to know a lot of these things. And bears don't really want to be captured. It takes a lot of time to convince them to go into things like culvert traps and catch themselves for us. It's expensive, it's time consuming, um, and is not always that successful. Sometimes we can have traps out for weeks at a time and not actually catch a bear like we did here. And that was a grizzly bear that went inside. When we capture them, we have to actually handle them. And the whole purpose of doing this is to put one of these on a bear, a radio collar. And it is amazing how much information we can get by putting a simple tracking device on these bears. But we have to, once we catch them, we have to handle them. If we can play this one. We've got a whole team of bear researchers that are actually working on this female bear right here, and they're putting a radio collar on her to make sure it fits, and she doesn't slip it off her head really easily. You can see really closely that we have a rag covering her eyes. She is totally sedated, and we really take monitoring their health care while they're under our care very seriously. She's got oxygen on her to um, help her health. And we do a lot of these things in order to make sure that putting a radio collar on the bears is not harming them. And then we have to let them go so we can find out things about them. In some cases, we can actually catch a bear with a foot snare in the woods, handle it right there and put a collar on it and let it sleep and walk away and then it'll go forth. Um, and give us the information. Sometimes that's not possible. We actually have them in culvert traps. We'll take them back to our office, handle them, and then we take them right back to where we caught them in order to release them. And it's a safer way sometimes 
to allow them to recover in these traps before we actually let them go. And this is a lot of what the information that we end up with. So with a simple, simple radio collar, and I say radio collar, but they are both, this package right here is both a VHF radio transmitter and a GPS uh, satellite system. So it has two different batteries, two different computer systems in it, and it sends out, it gives us two different types of information. With that, if a bear is wearing a radio collar on the landscape, we can find out where they're moving across the landscape, how fast they're going from point A to point B, what they're doing when they're there. For example, if a bear is spending a lot of time in a particular area during the month of August, um, in this area, perhaps he's eating uh, huckleberries. So we can go to those areas afterwards to find out what type of food resources that bear was interested in and why it spent so much time there. We can fly over a radio collared bear, um, a female, and find out through visualizing it on the ground whether she has cubs with her. And over the course of the time that we're tracking her with that collar, whether those cubs remain with her or whether she ended up with, uh, came out of her den with three cubs, and by the end of the first year, she only had one cub with her. We can learn a little something about cub mortality associated with that. We can learn about when they go into their dens, how long they stay in their dens, when they come out of their dens, their preference for den location, elevation, aspect, uh, all of that kind of stuff with something as simple as a radio collar. And the last thing I'll put on about this is connectivity and home range. We learn a lot about where bears are moving and why, and this is the cabinet yak ecosystem right here inside this line. And we do have bears that occasionally would go over or come from the continental divide ecosystem. We want this to happen, and we want this to happen so they can have bears exchanging genetic material. One bear from one bear or is breeding with another bear from here, and they are completely unrelated. And we want that to be able to happen. It doesn't happen as often as we'd like, but it's something that we're monitoring and hope that it continues. And we actually have that exchange, that connectivity between two populations. And then we learn something about what we call their home ranges, where any given bear is living in any one particular year. Each of these spaghetti lines are different bears wearing radio collars over the course of multiple years. And all of these bears, you can see, are crossing over all the same areas. Bears happily use the same space with each other. They don't pick a space and defend it to keep all other bears out, like mountain lions do. So they don't have a territory. They have just a general range in which they utilize over the course of the year. And with a grizzly bear, that can be anywhere between 100 to 250 square miles over the course of the year, depending on how good food resources are. All of that learns by just putting radio collars on. And you can play this while I talk. This is my <laughs> but we don't always get the opportunity to handle bears, and sometimes we can get information without handling them. And this bear is being so kind as to provide us hair with DNA um, in order to be able to take it off this rub tree that he's rubbing on, scratching his back and scratching his head, and he leaves us hair. We take that hair, we can learn out whether it's a male or a female. We can learn out who they're related to, um, if they're across the ecosystem, whether they're related to anybody else that we know through their individual identification. We can also learn something about diet. We can actually do something called stable isotope analysis on hair that was produced in the springtime or produced in the fall to find out what types of food resources that bear ate in order to grow that particular hair. Something we can't learn from by collaring. So we have a lot of different resources at our disposal to learn about bears. I wonder if we should pause for a question or two. Yeah, go ahead. Victor, do you have any questions so far? Okay. Uh, Jackson, why do bears rub their backs on trees? Why do bears rub their backs on trees? 
We have two reasons that they, we think they do this. They create these natural rubs, and we actually put barbed wire on these rubs in order to collect the hair that they naturally want to rub their backs on trees. And sometimes they will just rub their sides or their faces. We think they're leaving scent in order to advertise themselves to other male bears or possibly female bears to let them know who's who and what's what, particularly during breeding season. And the other part is I think they're just scratching. They're itchy. Mm. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, why were bears eliminated from the plains? Ah, great question. Well, with the plains area, we turned the plains into a lot of agricultural and ranching areas. And so they were eliminated because there was a lot of fear at uh, having sharing the space with grizzly bears, with people, and then um, a lot of concerns with grizzly bears killing cattle or uh, eating the grains that they were growing in their fields. And so uh, they were uh, persecuted and directly hunted and eliminated out of those plains areas uh, 150 years ago. Uh, call strip wants to know, have bears ever scratched off their collars? Yes, they have. And uh, we are very careful about how tight we put a collar on. We don't want to restrict their movements, but we also don't want it to come off that easily either. I have had bears that uh, were rubbing along the bridge abutments and left just this collar as a calling card and, and pulled their entire collar off um, using a bridge. So yes, they do sometimes take them off. Any other questions? Nope. All right. So just to finish up with DNA, um, with just DNA without actually handling any of the bears, we can actually create entire family trees that tell us about the health of a population. This is a family tree for just the bears in the Cabinet Mountain area for the Cabinet Yak ecosystem. This is all the bears that we knew of by 2015. Not a lot of bears. Right now, there's somewhere between 25 and 30 grizzly bears. That's it for that population alone. And we pretty much know all of them, and we know how they're related. And they're all related to this female or this female right here. And then they are all interrelated. All of the similar members, siblings, brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, are all breeding with each other. And over time, this is called inbreeding, and over time, this can have a big problem on the genetic health of the population. So through research, we learned that we need to help out this population to prevent what's called a genetic bottleneck and having problems associated with the genetic health of this. And so a lot of things that we can do um, is, is actually moving bears in from one area to another and mimic that walking you saw on the map from one area to another and uh, allowing a completely different group of gene pools to be brought in to allow these bears to, that are breeding with each other to be totally different and improving the health of the population. So let's switch from research to management. And management is always going to be necessary because where bears and people exist, there is always going to be some level of conflict. And that's the same when we live with any wildlife in our areas. When where people and wildlife exist together, there's always going to be something that happens that causes a conflict. And our primary job as bear specialists is to stop those conflicts when they happen and then to prevent conflicts from happening altogether. So we work a lot on prevention and being proactive with members of our community and our residences to try to stop these problems happening before they even begin. And our main goals is just to reduce conflicts as much as we are able to. Um, in my area, I'm trying to reduce the unnecessary mortality of grizzly bears because, as we mentioned, we have a uh, low reproduction and a small population, and every bear counts. And um, then we're trying to increase our public safety and uh, increase everybody's understanding of what is normal and natural about grizzly bears. How do we do this? Well, we do this for one of the reasons right here with, with events like this, um, and to be able to connect with schools and help people have a better understanding of, of grizzly bears. We do festivals, I do fairs, um, and connect with members of our public. 
Um, I bring uh, taxidermy bears into schools to talk about them. I give workshops on bear, uh, bear spray to, to increase people's understanding of how bear spray can keep them safe. I go to homes and help people uh, secure things that attract bears with things like electric fencing. And um, again, we, we reach out to the community members and uh, help out um, with people's understanding and to try to prevent those conflicts from occurring. And another way that we do that is we always try to talk about identification and how much time are we looking at? Are we doing well on time? We have got 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Okay, we're doing okay on time. We'll go through this kind of quickly because I know you guys are all experts already at identification. I just know this. So we'll go quickly through some identification and uh, we're going to talk about just four characteristics and we're going to watch a quick video and you guys are going to give me thumbs up on thumbs down and whether those are grizzly bears or black bears that you're seeing. So quick identification and can we see our, sure. our friends here today? Friends are coming back. All right. All right. So we have a grizzly bear here. We have a black bear here. And the main differences between the two species are four characteristics. Grizzly bears have short rounded ears that tend to be a little further set apart on their heads, whereas black bears have tall, more pointy ears, uh, maybe a little bit more triangular in shape. Grizzly bears have shoulder humps, which are, there it is, <laughs> which are muscle masses. Um, yes. And we have a question about the hump. Okay. Does a bigger hump mean they're stronger? I don't believe so. It just means it is a different shape of muscle mass um, based on the overall size of the bear. Hmm. There you go. Good question. Yeah. So uh, grizzly bears have it because it's a muscle mass that they use for digging. From the tip of their claws to the tip of their shoulders, their front ends are shovels, and they use it for digging. Whereas black bears don't have this shoulder hump because their bodies are designed to climb trees. And uh, they don't need that muscular shoulder hump in order to be able to climb trees, um, which is what they use to escape predators or whenever they feel threatened. The other one is claws. I mentioned tip of claws to tip of shoulder. Grizzly bears paw shape. Their toes are more in line um, with their, uh, their main pad, almost in a straight line. And their claws are almost as long as your fingers, two to four inches in length. And they use those to dig. And they eat, use the individual claws the same way, way we use our fingers to be able to dig and manipulate things in the ground in order to find food resources. Black bears paws and their toe shape are more curved in order to be able to grab a tree. And their claws are curved and sharp in order to be able to bite into tree bark in order to climb that tree as quickly as possible. And the last one is the shape of their face. Grizzly bears from tip of their forehead to tip of their nose are dished in shape, concave like this, whereas black bears are straighter from tip of the forehead, tip of their nose, they're more straight and they're a little bit more dog-like in shape. You are all experts now. Did you notice I did not talk about color? Color doesn't mean anything. Yep, we call them grizzly bears because a lot of them are grizzled in color. Yep, we call these American black bears because a lot of them are black in color. But as you can tell, this is a brown colored black bear. This is a grizzly colored grizzly bear. Grizzly bears can be black. They can be solid brown. They can be blonde. I'm sure they can even be albino. Black bears can be red. They can be smoky blue. They can be black. They can be blonde. They can be two-toned. So color is not going to tell you anything for identification. So when you look at the video, try to ignore the color of the bear and look for the four characteristics in combination in order to be able to tell what this is. Yes. Before we get to the video, again, cold strip. Good question. Does their tail have a use? No, actually their tail is so short, it's about that long. And as far as we can tell, it doesn't really do anything besides cover their bum. <laughs> Protection. Okay. So we've got a video. There are 10 bears. Oh, Victor has a question. Victor has a question. Sorry. Go ahead, Victor. No question. No question. All right. All right. Can we lower this again? Yep. Yeah. So what we're going to do, what we're going to do, guys, is you're going to see 10 bears um, in the video. 
If it's, thumbs up for grizzly bears. If it's a grizzly bear, thumbs up. If you think it's a black bear, thumbs down. All right, and at the end of each as it switches, I'll tell you whether you're right or wrong here, and I'm going to step out of frame here. Are we ready? All right, go for it. Are we set? Here they come. They don't always give you the view that you want, so make sure you take quickly stock of all those characteristics. What is it? I saw a couple thumbs up. It was a grizzly bear. Well, I'm seeing a mixed bag here. I see thumbs up and thumbs down. That was a black bear. Got this one. Thumbs down for black bear, thumbs up for grizzly. Thumbs down, it's a black bear. Nice job. I think I see everybody with their thumbs up. You're correct. This is a grizzly bear. Now look at the claws for this bear. See whether you can actually see them or not, because you're not going to get a better, better look at this bear. Oh, thumbs up, that was a grizzly bear. Thumbs up, that was a grizzly bear. Remember to ignore color. Nice. It is a black bear. And I hope you appreciate how fast that bear is moving straight up a 45 degree slope. Any thoughts? Ooh, mixed bag. That is a grizzly bear. I think I see everybody with thumbs down. That is a black bear, you are correct. Last one here, this was the best view you're gonna get right here. Ooh, I got a mixed bag. The color is misleading on that one. It is a black bear and this naughty black bear does this. He actually flattened our tires. He pulled the stem right out of those tires and then didn't even have the decency to get himself caught afterwards. All right, nice job, everybody. The whole point of this is, is that bears don't always give you the look that you want or need in order to be able to tell what it is that you're looking at. Um, and uh, you gotta have the practice in order to be able to gather all of those, those four pieces of information you need. And it isn't always as easy as people like to tell you it is. All right, let's go into diet. So this is an example of how different a grizzly bear's diet is across Montana. Um, diet is totally determined by habitat and we have a lot of different habitat throughout the state. For example, in this area where this diet graph comes from, we have a lot of berries and we have a lot of grasses and what are called forbs, which are woody stemmed plants um, and they eat both the stems and the roots of these plants. That's a huge part of their diet out here. Uh, more than 80% of their diet is, is these three things right here. Notice none of that is meat. Meat, which is in the red, is a very small, only 12% of their overall diet in any given year. And they're typically winter killed animals and uh, they clean up our forests, they clean up our roadsides. Uh, the more maggots on a dead animal, the better. It has a higher amount of protein. And uh, during breeding season for ungulates, we have injured animals, exhausted animals, or hunter uh, killed animals, wounded animals, and gut piles that they will utilize during the fall as well. But if you were to see this graph for, say, Yellowstone, uh, National Park and the surrounding area, you'd have a big difference. Yes, they have grasses, they don't have as many forbs, um, but, and they definitely don't have nearly as many berries. So they don't have the huckleberries in their area that sustains the grizzly bears in the cabinet yak ecosystem. They have meat in their diet would probably be closer to over 20% because they have the ability to hunt an open area better than they do in the forested area that this comes from. So their habitats are different, which means their diet is different based on what's provided by the habitat. 
It also means their sizes are different. So a bear's size is directly related to the type of food that it eats while it's growing um, between the age of one and five. So this is why the cabinet yak grizzly bears, which have their main protein in their diet is berries, and not for a long portion of the year, we have the smallest grizzly bears in the state, around the average of 400 pounds. But you go to other areas that, where they have larger amounts of protein in their diet in the form of meat or salmon, they're gonna be larger bears. So we have a lot of these differences even within the same species, depending on the habitat that they live in. And in sticking with food, there are two reasons, two primary reasons we have conflicts with bears, between bears and people. And the number one thing being that bears are drawn close to homes due to a food resource. And the next one being a surprise encounter with a grizzly bear that is a behavior related thing based on the defense of either their cubs or their food resource or their personal space. Unfortunately, we won't have time to talk about number two, but it does exist. We'll talk mostly about food resources in relation to human bear conflicts with people. Um, but I will touch base quickly on there is a third reason. And a lot of people are very afraid of this reason in relation to grizzly bears. However, it happens more commonly with black bears. Bears sometimes see us as a food resource, and we call those predatory bears. It happens more commonly throughout North America with black bears than it does with grizzly bears. As a matter of fact, I know of very few instances where it's ever happened with grizzly bears, where all the other times it has always been black bears that has happened. It is extremely rare and very uncommon. All right, more questions for you guys. We talk about a lot of buzzwords, and I'm sure you've already heard this, me say this, what is an attractant? And I want you guys to think about this. What is an attractant in relation to bears? And we have a, a very broad definition, but I wanna hear what you guys think. On what do you think is, is designated as an attractant in regard to bears? Maybe, maybe they could think of their area. Yeah, and particularly in your area, if you go know of some things. So in Victor, what would be something that would attract bears? And oh, by the way, are there grizzly bears in Victor? Where's no. Victor? Bitterroot? Bitterroot, not really. Bitterroot, no. We don't have an active population no. in the Bitterroot. Yeah. Any ideas, Victor? Bitterroot. Bitterroot. Flower. Do you mean you're flower, in the bitter root, or you mean the bitter root flower? Yeah. Flower. Yes. yes. All, of Both, all of the above. Yes. Yes. I. I, I don't. I, I think bears do eat bitter roots. I think they do eat all kinds of those types of plants underground. So that is one. But when we talk about attractants, think about human-related things. We don't typically live right next to a giant field of bitter root flowers. Other ideas? Trash. Let's see. Trash. 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 Grass. Garbage. Grass. Well, so these are food resources. You're not wrong. But what about human-related things? The things that we have, yes, we have bread. Bears do interested in grasses Grass. in our yards. What else? What else I missed that one. Trash. 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 Garbage. Yes. Excellent. Uh, like cooking food? Cooking food, right? Anything human food related that we eat. Anything else? I have a question. Let's speak loud. I have a question. Go ahead. How, how far can a bear smell? How far can a bear smell? Several miles away. They have a olfactory system, which is their entire sensory system for smell that is probably a hundred times better than a bloodhound. We don't exactly know the number, but it is amazingly excellent. And it is how they find their food from miles away. I heard chickens from Coal Strip, correct? No, that was me. <laughs> yes, small livestock. One other and we'll keep moving. Any others? Go ahead. Maybe gutting or cleaning up uh, like a fish or a deer? 
Yes, yes. People that harvest animals or harvest wildlife, bring them home, hang them, or leave gut piles or parts of those animals around their house. Absolutely. Yes. Awesome. So basically, it's any human-related food resource, meaning that we would not have lambs and sheep on the landscape for bears to try to eat if we didn't have people growing them. We wouldn't have fruit trees in our backyard if we didn't have a person planting it, right? So they're all human type related foods. Um, the rest are just natural foods in their diet, but an attractant is that specific thing that is human related that causes a conflict with people. And so here's the next question. What is a human bear conflict? What does it mean for a human and bear to be in conflict with each other? Do we have any guesses or any experiences? <laughs> Um, like a, a bear, uh, like attacking a human. Yes, that is a conflict. Absolutely. That's a confrontation that we hope to avoid, but that is definitely a human bear conflict. Yes. Any others? Um, like surprising a bear. Surprising a bear, right? Yep. That can certainly cause the next one. Um, Colstrip wants to know how do bears typically die? Human caused or other? So it's a mixed bag. We have, uh, we have a lot, we've really eliminated a lot of the primary reasons why bears die to our causes, but sometimes those can't be avoided because we do kill them on purpose for some very good reasons. But bears do, do, do die of natural causes. But we are probably the main primary cause once they are adults, because bears have about a 90 95% success rate in living without our intervention. So they typically die more of uh, old age um, or if they're hunted through hunting or human related reasons. Good question. Great. We've got about four minutes. All right. So we'll just run through these two videos. We'll just let them play while, while I talk. I think I need to move your bears. We'll, we'll move our friends down here. So we have a lot of ways that we can prevent these human bear conflicts, right? Any situation in which a bear is trying to access an attractant, a human food related food resource. One of these is electric fencing. That bear just got shocked by an electric fence and we use those in places we can't secure something that a bear is interested in any other better way. Chicken coops, fruit trees, livestock, those kinds of things. And it's a wonderful resource and one that we use on a regular basis to help prevent conflicts or stop them once they start. Someone mentioned garbage. Garbage is still one of our primary reasons we have human bear conflicts in Montana. And this bear is doing CPR to try to get into a bear proof garbage container. We use these containers, we loan them out to residences, and we try to get communities to use them to try to reduce the amount of garbage that's available to bears across our landscapes. And lastly, we do catch bears, but we use 90% of other things prior to needing to catch a bear. We do catch and move bears or even catch and kill bears when it's necessary and when the situation is right to be able to use that tool to resolve a conflict. We do not use this as our primary tool. Um, it's not always the right thing to use for certain situations. It is very time consuming, it's very expensive, and it is very detrimental in many cases to the bear. And often it doesn't work the way we want it to. So if we were to catch and move a bear that, for example, broke into a chicken coop, moved it 25, 50 miles away, and in five days, and this happens, the bear moved right back home, walked all the way back home on its own and got back into the chicken coop, we didn't really solve anything. We spent a lot of time, but we didn't really permanently solve the conflict, which was bears getting into chicken coop. And so the tool for this particular case, maybe the best tool would have been used an electric fence. And that way this bear and no other bear in the future can ever get back into it. This is my point of view when I release a bear. I'm inside a truck, um, and sometimes it takes a long time for a bear to decide to actually leave a trap. When I catch a bear, it's a 24 hour to 36 hour commitment to this bear's health. And so it takes me off of all other tasks that I need to do in order to keep this bear as safe as possible when I need to capture and relocate one. 
I spent a lot of time behind my wheel. My uh, truck is my mobile office, and uh, I, I go a lot, spend a lot of time from residence to residence to residence um, using all the, the tools that I have in my tool bag in order to help prevent human bear complex. Great. Let's take a final question or yeah. two from Victor, and if Colstrip's still on, go ahead and type us a, a question if you have one. Um, Victor, do you have any final questions? Perfect. Um, why, why are grizzly bears so aggressive? So grizzly bears, uh, aggressive is kind of a loaded word that sort of uh, is making a suggestion of how they feel in that moment in time. They are very defensive, though. And what they're doing is that we have, when we encounter one, we've either, they've either felt that they had defend their cubs because we were a threat to them, whether we were or not, that's how they were feeling at the time, um, that we invaded their personal space and that they needed to defend it, and, or we invaded their food and uh, interrupted a meal or a nap and they felt they need to defend themselves. Unfortunately, we are soft, we're squishy, and we injure very easily with such a large carnivore out there. And so whether they plan to severely injure us or not, that's sometimes what happens. And a lot of people call that aggression. It really is just defending themselves in the best and only way they know how. Do you have another question, Victor? Sure. Can a bear live with three legs? Yes, and it has happened. Yes, absolutely. Great question. Sometimes they get injury, injured, and bears are really have amazing immune systems to be able to live a long and healthy life with some pretty significant injuries. In New Jersey, there was a bear that was nicknamed Petals that walked on two legs permanently for a year. It stood upright and walked on its two back legs because its front legs were too injured to walk on. Wow. Well, thank you guys. And let's bring Lori back in. And uh, Lori, you can talk to the, the folks out there. Okay, well, thanks for joining us today. And I just want to encourage everybody that is participating in this challenge to go onto your virtual platform and learn even more about grizzly bears and submit a great project at the end. We are planning on formally recognizing those projects that really stand out. Um, we'll do it in some way at Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, definitely on our website, and maybe another couple surprises, too, as well. In addition, we have another live event that will be on March 7th, and that will be a panel of stakeholders that are involved in grizzly bear conservation and management. Make sure that you tune into that. And then finally, if you like doing distance learning and you're having a good time, we're going to be doing a sage grouse distance learning program in the spring, and you want to stay tuned for that, too, as well. But thanks for joining us. And I look forward to seeing your amazing projects.